So welcome to our afternoon session uh, away from this interactive part back to yes, uh, talks. I have to announce the first speaker. It is Urs Schöpflin. He is director for, of the research library of the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science. And um, yeah, he was participating in a European cultural heritage online project, EU funded. I think also a very interesting thing to see what is, uh, has been in the past and now making this public. And he's very interested in metrics, a subject that has been covered in several talks before. So please, Os Schöpflin, it's yours. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And now I, I struggle with windows. This is toll. Absolutely. Slides. Mittwoch. Schöpfling. Da. Double check. Voilà. Here we are. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, thank you again uh, for the introduction. Now the, the image is up. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me, for giving me the opportunity to talk here to you. And uh, the day was already very inspiring. And uh, so now I would like to, um, first of all, introduce uh, briefly my institution. I'm from the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science. And uh, we are known uh, to be very involved in uh, scholarship and internet. From the inception of the institute, uh, it was founded in 1994, so f 20 years ago. Uh, we uh, put up digitization programs to in enhance our empirical basis to do research uh, in history of science. Um, we were also developing uh, um, research uh, infrastructure to do our research. We are very much into using the internet as a research space and as dissemination space, and we are involved in the open access movement. Um, when you look at this list, you see a number of topics which are very familiar, which came up in the last two decades, so to say, uh, some of which has been addressed also this morning and during uh, the, the lightning talks. Um, many of these topics have been supported and fostered by special uh, funding programs by the German Science Foundation, by the National Science Foundation of the US and by others. Um, some of these, these developments have even turned into real uh, research areas and disciplines like digital humanities. You can see now calls for professorships in digital humanities, so this is something completely new. Um, and in a way, these topics were all answers. But what was the question? Why did we do all that? So I do not want to talk about an empirical project about the influence of social media uh, in scholarship. I don't want to talk about specific funded projects uh, that follow a certain lead in the use of uh, internet media or social media or whatever. What I would like to do is to go a step back and talk about our experience with internet and scholarship and how we at our institute have developed our experience and our knowledge about what we are doing. So these are the points I will uh, briefly raise. 
uh, illustrating uh, every point with about two, uh, with a slide or two. So looking back, we have looked back already. The scholarly perspective, this is what I try to allude to. So I will take not a library perspective, I will rather take a scholarly perspective. Um, I will uh, summarize the research challenges uh, to do research in the internet as we see it, as we have experienced it. I will try to sketch the conventional vision of uh, the uh, knowledge economy. Uh, we will briefly talk about the expansion of knowledge and its fragmentation, and then try to develop an alternative vision of a new kind of uh, knowledge economy. Open access is a, an important point, one of the prerequisites of uh, what we do. Um, I will allude to dynamic documents as opposed to the classical document as we know it. And in the end, uh, we will have some points for the outlook and maybe for discussion. So how do we see the challenges uh, of the web for research? Of course, everybody is aware about the current dramatic development, rapid development of knowledge. So since about the Second World War, uh, the, the growth rate of knowledge as represented, for instance, in journal articles is, is still uh, rising. The internet, uh, since uh, 10 or 20 years, also triggered uh, amount of new knowledge that becomes available in an unforeseen and never experienced way. And the, this collective creation of knowledge is not only limited to the sciences, they were certainly up front and they were the first, but it is the longer the more also a case for the humanities. And the research we are doing at our institute is, uh, belongs to the humanities uh, research section. We also experience uh, continuous transformation and renewal of our knowledge. And this is an, at an ever, uh, uh, gr uh, ever growing speed, information, de information decay in physics, for instance, uh, physical information has uh, a lifetime of two to 10 years, and then it's superseded by new knowledge. In the humanities, of course, it's not that fast, but we see uh, also triggered by the internet, an enormous uh, uh, um, speed in the transformation and permanent renewal of knowledge. So this is one thing, the dynamics of knowledge production and the, the dynamic of our knowledge, and our, our bodies of knowledge. On the other hand, the external representations of this common knowledge are still in a not so advanced state. So they are lagging behind. So if you look at this image and we say heading for new shores, we are heading for new shores, but with very traditional means. When we are looking at internet uh, uh, publications, we are, when we are trying to upload our research results on the internet, we are permanently confronted with the, uh, the experiences of traditional media. A document has to be finite and has to be peer reviewed and it's, it's static and then it can be uploaded. Um, the documents itself are not interconnected, those who are which are published on the internet are not interconnected. So we don't make use of the function of the capacities and the functionalities of the internet to exploit the potential uh, of this media to integrate the bodies of knowledge we produce and we upload. So this is one of the basic problems. And it, we can try and sketch the conventional vision of the knowledge economy, and it looks about like that. So in the, in the middle, uh, we start with the production of knowledge, with research, so scholars do that. Uh, we follow uh, then on the right-hand side. The research result is finished, so we have done our research. Two years of grant uh, funding uh, is used to obtain a research result. The research result is there. It should be 
made available publicly, so it has to be acknowledged by a body of uh, the scholarly community or uh, by a, a quality control process organized by a publisher who, is, uh, who should publish the work. So it's a peer review process going on which is completely separate from the research process. So it is the first filter that will decide whether the research is good enough, whether it has to be enhanced, to become eligible to, uh, uh, to be published. Then the next step, when the, uh, the uh, research result is, is acknowledged, um, it is published by traditionally by a printer in printed form. The dissemination is done as a finite, stable, static object like a journal article or a book. The book is then archived, not with the publisher and not with the, uh, the, the originator, with the scholar, but in the library. So it's another filter, what kind of materials are going into the library and the archive there in the, in the bookshelves. Then the, the research result sits there. Librarians, they do cataloging, they generate important metadata on the work. Uh, it is their standards, librarian standards, how to generate metadata. This is a very developed technique, of course, but it has nothing to do with the idea of the scholar who originally uh, did uh, the, scholar, uh, the work. So, the scholar has his ideas about the research he does. There's a first filtering process with quality control and peer review. The filtering process is already aimed at having a research result published with the publisher, who, as a publisher, has, its own has his own standards, how a book should look like, how many pages it should have, what can be included, what not, and things like that. So we have a number of filters in action. The news, the knowledge about the item that is uh, archived uh, in the shelves of a library is communicated uh, via catalogs, via bibliography, so on the level of metadata, which, as I uh, mentioned already, are generated at the standard of the librarians. And this is the interface uh, by, uh, through which other scholars can learn about uh, uh, the research result of uh, scholar number one. Let me take this number. And then the, uh, the book is retrieved, or the article is retrieved from the library, and uh, then only then the article or the book, the knowledge that is contained there, can re-enter the research process. So this is tr the traditional and static uh, knowledge economy. One of the results of this knowledge economy is a separation of research and dissemination, as I mentioned. Another result is that the data, if they are at all, the research data, if they are at all reproduced in the research result and made ready for dissemination, are confined in static representations. As a user, I don't have the opportunity to use this data in, the, uh, in a model of uh, open link data and uh, uh, let's say uh, tap on data and on data sets that are in the internet and uh, do my own research on these data. Traditionally these data are just confined statically and not accessible. And then, if you look at the example, this is the example of research that has been done at our institute. It was a, an empirical study, a cultural uh, comparison of the knowledge of children about physics. Um, this, these studies were done in Berlin with Berlin school children and with children on the Trobrian Islands. Those who are in anthropology remember uh, Tropian Islands have been subject to anthropolog uh, anthropological research by Malinowski, for instance. Okay, this was a comparative study. The result in this book, it's, uh, it's a doctoral dissertation, is just a summary. 
and neither the interviews nor, nor the photos nor the, nor the videos could be reproduced there. So the entire information hinterland, as we can call it, is just missing. So this is the tra a traditional research publication. I mentioned the, the growth of knowledge, and also uh, if we talk about growth of knowledge, we should uh, know that the information explosion is also sometimes mainly a result of the fragmentation of bodies of knowledge. So we are bound to work uh, very in very spe uh, special fields, and we, pub we are pushed to publish, so we, we publish the least publishable unit and uh, so this, of course, helps to fragmentize, uh, to fragment the, the bodies of knowledge. So the traditional publication system is fostering fragmentation of knowledge representations by very special journals uh, and by uh, pushing the authors to um, give away just small bits of their, their research in, in the, in the, uh, so that they can have a, a longer list of publications. They do not have the, they are not pushed to integrate the research results, but they publish very uh, little pieces of knowledge. And of course, this is reflected by the shape uh, of academic careers. Those who are in academic careers know about specialization, about uh, evaluation, uh, of their own research achievements, how the uh, um, uh, different disciplines and com communities have their standards and uh, they tell you exactly in what journal you have to publish to be eligible for certain positions uh, in, uh, in academia. One could, knowing all this, one could come to an alternative vision uh, of the knowledge cycle, and this is what you see in this slide. Um, the slide uh, starts... Um, the slide starts here, on this, this side, source, uh, source collection, and goes uh, 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 clockwise. Counterclockwise. So we start with a collection of research material. We call it here source collection. Could be anything from observational uh, astronomical data to an old manuscript. This, of course, is analyzed and it is uh, enhanced with other similar documents. They are annotated, the documents are interlinked, uh, uh, and in the end uh, uh, we can have not only the anal analysis, but we can compare the different uh, documents, and we can begin to, inter uh, to, 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 we can begin with our interpretation. The result are commented is a set of commented sources as a new body of knowledge. Uh, we have obtained a new level of knowledge by uh, comparing, by enhancing the content. And uh, if we uh, consider this as an ongoing research proce process, maybe not a two years cycle, but a 10 years uh, uh, project cycle, um, then uh, at a certain moment we think now we would like to make the community aware of what we have achieved so far and when, then we release what we have, the, the comments and the, the raw data and uh, the analyzed sources, we release them and make them available. So this is a new body of knowledge of published sources. These published sources are then uh, taken up by other scholars, so this is the reception phase and they form a new secondary source with our material. And this secondary source is later on integrated into our first body of knowledge. And by this, we don't have an information cycle, but we have an information coil, a spiral. So we have a new level. We bring our body of knowledge to a new level. This is the alternative vision of a, a knowledge cycle. Of course, the precondition for this to work is that everything is open access. All the data, 
all the background data, all the information hinterland, as I called it, uh, should be uh, in open access. You see here on the, on the slide, first of all, the arguments for open access, you know many of the, the current and the traditional arguments. One argument is the economic one, mainly uh, the economic argument for open access is a librarian's argument. So you know, uh, more than 10 years ago, we had the uh, journal crisis, so because libraries were not able anymore to pay the subscription fees for printed journals. So uh, a rising subscription cost is one argument for open access. Another argument is a more moral argument. We, as scholars paid by the taxpayer, would like to give the ta taxpayer something back. We don't want the taxpayers to need to buy back the research result we uh, generated with taxpayers' money. So this is a more moral argument. But then it's a, there is a third argument, the scholarly argument. This is the argument which is valid here. So the other two arguments are very valid arguments, of course. But the third argument, the scholarly argument, uh, is the one I wanted to, uh, to, to allude here to. We can really exploit the potential of the internet only if all the elements we are using for, to, to do our research are really openly and freely available. So on the slide you can see from the left the manuscript, you can see the, um, uh, the manuscript on, on, old, uh, uh, on ancient balances. This is a current research project we are doing in Berlin with the, in the framework of the Topoi Excellence uh, Initiative. You see then the photograph of a museum object, so of a, an ancient balance. We then have... Um, Metrics. We have scholarly metadata, not just descriptive metadata, but scholarly metadata about the object. And then we have a comparison of various objects that have been compared for their accuracy of, uh, uh, of in, in weighing. So these kinds of data together form the body of knowledge we are using for this kind of research. And uh, the research can only take place if all these four elements are openly and freely available. Uh, 11 years ago, the Berlin Declaration has been uh, declared uh, by the Max Planck Society and by, by now more than 470 international research and cultural organizations, universities, museums, research institutes. Um, and it says that our mission of disseminating knowledge is only half complete if the information is not made widely and readily available to society, and so on. So you can easily look that up if you Google uh, uh, the Berlin Declaration. This is 11 years ago. And in some parts of the movement, we can see the progress, and in other parts, we still need to do a lot of work. Um, if we look towards the possibilities of an epi epistemic web, uh, I would like to briefly mention one of our uh, open access reach, uh, research environments. Uh, ECHO was just uh, alluded in when I was introduced. Uh, this originally was funded, co-funded by the European Union, but only for 18 months. And since then, our institute is taking care of ECHO. We are the organizers. And together with about 170 content provider, this is the material we make openly available on the internet for you and for everybody else to work with. So this is long before Europeana and long before conceptions like the German Digital Library, which comes up now and it will, uh, the German Digital Library will officially be launched next Monday uh, in Berlin. So ECHO is much, much older and you, you can see the content that we make openly available and available for reuse. Um, the, on, the online availability of sources is not just only nice, but it's also important in the research process to be able to give access to the sources one has used to obtain the research uh, results that we publish. This is 
more known in the sciences, lesser known in the humanities. In the humanities, it's still the habit that you quote and the person who does the peer review and the reader, they have just to trust you whether your quotes are correct or not. So when you have all the sources you use for your research result openly available, this becomes a completely new situation in scholarship because the research process is transparent and any reader and any evaluator and any peer reviewer can immediately go to the original source and see whether your inter interpretation is correct or, the, or whether he or she would have a different view. This is an example of our, um, of our uh, uh, Cuneiform Digital Library Initiative we run with, together with uh, University uh, of California. And it reproduces uh, 10 thousands of ancient clay tablets uh, these are uh, find, archaeological finds of Mesopotamia. Um, something else can be done in an epistemic work. We can bring, bring to be, together various bodies of knowledge in a new way and present them together on the internet. This is an example of, a, uh, of materials on a Renaissance garden in, um, in near Florence, the Pratolino Garden. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see an aerial view. It's from Google Earth. It's combined with a historic uh, area map in an overlay technique. In the middle, you have a current uh, photograph on the Pratolino Garden with links to, um, uh, to where you can navigate in this uh, uh, representation of uh, uh, the virtual knowledge space. And on the right-hand side, you have a um, a digital representation of a, um, of a manuscript that is uh, held by the um, uh, state, uh, state Archive in Stuttgart. So all this together brought on the internet form a new kind of presenting and representing uh, the, uh, 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 the bodies of knowledge in an adequate way to the internet. Uh, Overcoming the separation of the digital object and the metadata in the mistebic web is therefore one of the crucial aims. I was notified that I have to speed up, so I go uh, faster. Uh, this is an example also within uh, our research infrastructure where we have a Chinese uh, original book. We have a transcription, we have a translation, we have comments to the translation, we have links to dictionaries, and we have links to a special uh, viewer which allows us to uh, zoom into uh, book pages and, let's say, see details not only of the script but also of the illustrations. All this combined into one research environment makes uh, uh, a step forward and is an adequate uh, a representation of uh, knowledge in the internet. Uh, to summarize, uh, overcoming the separation of digital object and metadata can maybe be visualized uh, in this way. This is the same schema we had before. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see source collection represented by ECHO. We have dynamic documents because the documents are enhanced and analyzed and commented. Uh, on the go by the, uh, by the scholarly community. Every now and then when the, the scholar think we would like to make parts of the research results available, we re make a release and this, uh, um, the results will become available uh, as digital publication on the internet. They will be taken up, uh, more uh, comments and uh, uh, more interpretations uh, and more sources can be added and we uh, finally we end in a new phase of uh, uh, source collection and, uh, on a new level. So the notion of a finite document is in a way revised and we live in a, a, a time when uh, documents uh, have not only links to various other instances of sources, resources, tools, and so on, but the document itself and its contents are permanently moving. So 
as an outlook for further challenges, quality control of non-finite documents is something we have to think about. We are actively thinking about that at our institute. Trusted content, we heard more from, uh, about that this morning already. Recognition and credits, how can we make uh, um, um, evaluation uh, committees make aware of the work we publish in this way, and how can we re get credit for this kind of uh, uh, um, publications? For libraries, now I address the, the library community, curation of living documents, metadata, and primary data is something we have to think about. Long-term availability, not of static documents, this is solved, we know how to do that, but of living documents with all the connecting uh, materials uh, is uh, something new. Management of flexible collections, we are about to resolve that at our institute for one research department is something new. New skills and qualifications for librarians will need to come up. And in the end, we will have a, a vision of a new models of research libraries. So this is uh, what I wanted to bring in for discussion. And I, I thank you for your attention. And if there is time, I'm ready to take your questions. Questions, please. Yeah, please take the microphone. That will ease the recording of the session. Thank you. Um, for the Cuneiform Library, I would be interested in the kind of markup that you perform, because you mentioned that there is XML being produced. Um, to what extent is it? Uh, is there any form of inf uh, automation going on? Do you use ontologies for that? So the, the metadata, so we have not only metadata to every single object, uh, we have also to a good part of the, the cuneiform texts, we have transcriptions, an early form of crowdsourcing, by the way, because students in many universities all over the world who were used this for, uh, for tr their own training sessions, and we were able to, to bring that in. Uh, the, the, it's an XML schema behind. You can download uh, these, uh, the texts, and you can openly reuse the texts. Next one, just in front. Thank you for the uh, presentation. Uh, I wonder to what, and, and I'm not a librarian, and that's why I'm asking this. Uh, uh, to what extent, as a scientist, uh, uh, I, I would be responsible to um, store uh, my uh, online publications or online texts uh, in a sustainable way, which I uh, produce in the context of research activity, let's say in blogs or on websites, not the PDFs that perhaps had been already uh, sent to a conference like this or that had been published with a journal, but, but all the other uh, outcomes. Mm -hmm. is, is this something we, we have to care for? Is this something that may just disappear after a project funding has been, uh, yeah. well, Unfort completed? Unfortunately, the situation is as you describe it uh, in the end. Uh, once the project is gone, is gone, the material is gone also. So this is a still unsolved problem, not only in Germany, but in other countries as well. This is a problem connected to the short-term funding, like two or three years project cycles. Then people are away, scholars go away, nobody takes care of the data. So they die away sooner or later. If so, nobody moves them to new, uh, to new systems. Uh, so this is one of the problems still unsolved. Uh, the current normal research results, their universities, the Max Planck Society, have their own repositories. And I have uh, two colleagues of Max Planck Society sitting over there, over there dealing with uh, our publication repository. And uh, so on the, on the level of current static publications, the problem is solved. The, the problem is not solved for the information hinterland is not solved for uh, databases and so on, which need, which, which can be frozen, but need nevertheless care and uh, to, to keep them uh, online and to migrate them to new system if the old system dies out. Thank you. So many people are thinking about that, but there is no, not one solution.
So thank you very much. Now I have a wonderful task to present to you a box of tea. I thank you, and uh, I'm a tea drinker, so I'm very, I will be very fun to drink your tea. <laughs>